Success in the North American home gaming market eluded Sega during the 8-bit era, but they struck gold with the 16-bit Sega Genesis. Missteps in the winning days of the console's lifespan eroded consumer confidence, and questionable decisions about the launch of the Sega Saturn, along with shifting priorities at Sega of Japan, doomed any chance the company had against the Sony PlayStation on this side of the globe. But in the late 1990s, it was Sega who would kick off the next generation of gaming when they developed what would become their final home console. On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, we take a look at Sega's swan song in the home hardware market with the 1999 launch of the Sega Dreamcast. In the early 1990s, Sega was arguably at its peak. They were still heating up the arcades with cutting-edge titles like Virtua Fighter and Daytona USA, and were also releasing new takes on established properties, including Outrunners, and The Revenge of Death Adder. Although home console success had still been elusive in Japan, elsewhere in the world the Mega Drive and Genesis had become a hit. On the backs of such legendary franchises as Sonic the Hedgehog, Streets of Rage, Fantasy Star, and the EA Sports lineup, which helped to create an entire generation of sports gamers. In 1994, as a stopgap measure until the next generation of hardware was ready for release, the Segas of America and Japan jointly developed the 32X, an add-on for the Mega Drive and Genesis that allowed gamers to play 32-bit games on their 16-bit consoles. Released in North America in time for the 1994 Christmas season, the 32X got off to a strong start. But also created consumer uncertainty as it was released in the US at the same time that the real 32-bit system, the Saturn, launched in Japan. The 32X would become a public relations black eye for Sega when after releasing a meager lineup of titles for the system, it was discontinued just 18 months after launch. Development of the Saturn began in Japan in 1992 and was first shown to the public at the Tokyo Toy Show in the summer of 1994. Designed initially with sprite-based graphics in mind, The Saturn system specs were altered late in the development cycle in response to the upcoming Sony PlayStation's polygon-centric design, with the end result being a far more complicated hardware architecture. The Saturn hit Japanese stores in November of 1994, along with a home port of arcade hit Virtua Fighter, a game that on launch day sold nearly as well as the system itself. The Saturn was scheduled to be released in North America in September of 1995, but at the Electronic Entertainment Expo in May, in order to beat the forthcoming Sony PlayStation to market, Sega of America President Tom Kalinske shocked the gaming world by announcing that the system had already been shipped to select retailers. Consumers who may have felt wary about supporting Sega after the under-supported Sega CD and 32X largely balked at the system's initial $400 price tag. Sega also damaged relations with retailers who had been frozen out of the console's surprise launch, with mall mainstay KB Toys vowing never to carry the system. Sony would ultimately sign exclusivity deals with both KB Toys and Circuit City, making the PlayStation the only 32-bit console sold at 1,500 retail locations nationwide. Developers who thought they were readying launch titles for the Saturn also soured, with Electronic Arts, Sega's biggest third-party developer on the Genesis, having a vastly reduced presence on the new console. 
As time wore on, PlayStation sales continued to eclipse those of the Saturn, and Sony began signing exclusivity agreements with developers who had been putting games out for Sega, including Eidos, whose perhaps most famous title Tomb Raider had for a time been the best-selling game on the Saturn. But while Sega was struggling to stay afloat here in North America, the Saturn was actually selling well in Japan. In fact, the Saturn was the most popular console Sega had released in Japan, selling a total of 6 million units over the course of its lifetime. Sega was finally experiencing success in their home country and was blaming Sega of America for a lack of success here. This new trans-Pacific dynamic between the two Segas would ultimately cost the American side perhaps its most valuable asset, when Kalinske resigned from the company in the summer of 1996. Whether due to hubris or self-delusion, Sega believed that their first-party titles were the real meat and potatoes of the Saturn's library, and were at least outwardly not bothered by ever-shrinking third-party support. Although the Saturn had for a time been able to maintain a marginal lead over the PlayStation in Japan, it was the 1997 release of Square's PlayStation-exclusive Final Fantasy VII that finally pushed Sony's console into the lead and foreshadowed the Saturn's demise. In 1980, Bernie Stoller co-founded arcade game company Pacific Novelty, releasing Shark Attack the following year. Pacific Novelty put out a handful of other games, including NATO Defense, before being bought out by Atari just prior to the video game crash. But Stoller's next business venture, creating conversion kits out of Japanese arcade games like Mr. Do, ultimately led to a job as president and head of product development at Atari Corporation under CEO Jack Trammell. I mean, the, the, the consumer is more sophisticated. He's seen more. He understands more. At the time, Atari had re-entered the dedicated home gaming market with the Lynx, a 16-bit full-color handheld. This became Stoller's primary focus, and he championed the technology as the most advanced when compared to the Game Boy and Game Gear. But by 1993, Stoller was frustrated with Atari's knack for creating great hardware with poor software support. That year, he joined Sony Computer Entertainment of America, where his role was to attract third-party developers to the forthcoming PlayStation. This included signing a six-month exclusivity deal with Williams for Mortal Kombat 3, which would become one of the hit PlayStation releases of 1995. Jax wins. In 1996, Stoller joined Sega of America as the executive vice president of product development. Brought on board to help usher in a new era at Sega with the underperformance of the Saturn, in an interview with Electronic Gaming Monthly, Stoller famously stated that the Saturn was not Sega's future. Here, in an effort to minimize financial risk, Stoller enacted a five-star game rule, meaning that the only titles to be published on the Saturn should be bona fide hits. As a result, there simply wasn't enough quality software coming out for the Saturn in the West. By the end of 1997, the system accounted for a dismal 2% of the North American home gaming market, and as successful as the Saturn was in Japan, overall Sega was in poor financial health having lost by some estimates over a billion dollars over the course of the Saturn's lifetime. Stoller, who by the spring of 1998 was serving as president of Sega of America, knew that if the company continued to hemorrhage money, they would lack the cash needed to stay in the hardware business. In March of 1998, the American division announced the final first-party games for the platform, House of the Dead, Burning Rangers, and Shining Force 3. Cross that bridge and proceed through the door and after their release, discontinued the system. For the first time in 12 years, Sega of America would no longer have an actively supported home console. Development of a follow-up to the Saturn was being discussed as early as 1994, but it wasn't until 1996 with the release of the Nintendo 64 that Sega decided to get serious about a next-generation machine. In the mid-1990s, 3D graphics acceleration was the hot new thing in PC gaming, and the company leading the charge was 3DFX, who made the popular Voodoo line of accelerator cards, popularized by games like 1996's Quake.
in February of 1997, Sega partnered with 3DFX to design a graphics chipset for their next generation console. In fact, as a collaboration between 3DFX and Sega of America, a successor to the Saturn was being developed completely outside Sega of Japan. Codenamed Black Belt, the effort was led by former Power PC design engineer Tatsuo Yamamoto. With input from developers who had released games on the Saturn, Yamamoto attempted to address that system's shortcomings and create a console that facilitated ease of game design. Predictably, for Black Belt, Yamamoto initially paired the Voodoo Graphics chipset with a PowerPC 603E CPU. Seeing the operating system as another fault of the Saturn, the American design team looked to Microsoft to provide Black Belt with a developer-optional Windows-based operating system, again with an eye towards simplifying game development. In the summer of 1997, it was revealed that Sega of Japan had also been designing a successor to the Saturn. Codenamed Dural after the Virtua Fighter character, the project was led by Hideki Sato, the hardware engineer who had overseen the development of nearly every Sega console, including the Saturn. The Japanese design centered around the Hitachi SH4 CPU, the follow-up to the SH2 used in both the 32X and Saturn. Sato's team chose the Power VR graphics chipset, at the time owned by Japanese electronics giant NEC, and while not the household name that Voodoo was, it potentially offered a superior value for its performance. And Microsoft, it turned out, had been working with both design teams to provide a more developer-friendly OS. Naturally, Sega of America favored Yamamoto's design, while Sega of Japan backed Sato's. In the early fall, when the time came to decide between the two, for reasons that can only be speculated upon, Sega of Japan overruled its Western division, choosing the Dural to replace the Saturn. Causing an expected mass exodus from the American design team and a costly lawsuit from 3DFX. In early 1998, Sega announced that the new system, now codenamed Katana, would ship out to Japanese stores in time for that year's Christmas season. That May, at a press event called the Sega New Challenge Conference, Shoichiro Irimajiri, who had replaced ousted Hayao Nakayama as the president of Sega, officially unveiled the Sega Dreamcast outlining its final hardware specifications and showing off a handful of tech demos. Six days later at the 1998 Electronic Entertainment Expo, Bernie Stoller announced the Dreamcast to the Western world with an expected release in the autumn of 1999. The Dreamcast's hardware specs easily bested anything that the console gaming world had seen up to that point. Under the hood, the system is powered by the aforementioned 32-bit 200MHz Hitachi SH4 RISC processor, an NEC Power VR2 graphics chip, and a Yamaha 64-channel super-intelligent sound processor. 16 megabytes of dedicated system RAM is joined by 8 megabytes of video memory and another 2 megabytes for sound. The Dreamcast can output video via composite, S-video, and RGB at both 240p and 480i resolutions but compatible games can also be displayed in 480p using a VGA adapter. The front of the system offers four controller ports, reflective of Sega's desired emphasis on multiplayer play. The controller itself features both an analog thumbstick and traditional D-pad, four action buttons on the face, and two spring-loaded analog triggers. The controller also has two expansion sockets at the top, into which one can plug Sega's jump pack, adding force feedback. But more importantly, into these sockets plugs the Visual Memory Unit, or VMU, which serves as the console's memory card, but also features its own LCD screen, along with both a D-pad and action buttons. The VMU contains 100 kilobytes or 200 blocks of accessible storage space, as well as mini-games that can be downloaded from certain Dreamcast titles. The VMU's LCD screen is also viewable when the unit is plugged into the controller, a feature of which a number of Dreamcast games take advantage. Management of the VMU storage is performed using the console's built-in menu system, which automatically loads when the system is powered on without a disk or with the drive door open. Along with the power and multi-AV jacks, also found on the back of the console is a serial port, which is compatible with a seldom-used system link cable, but through a collaboration with SNK, the serial port is also compatible with the Neo Geo Pocket Cable, 
allowing data to be transferred between certain SNK-published Dreamcast titles and their analogous Neo Geo Pocket releases. At this time, the system also included a 36-6 modem, which allowed for online multiplayer play with compatible games, as well as web browsing with the Dream Passport disc that would be included with Japanese consoles. DVD support had been rejected on budgetary grounds, but Sega also wanted to avoid using the CD-ROM format, which by the late 90s was too prone to piracy. As a collaboration with Yamaha, Sega developed the Gigabyte Disc, or GD-ROM. The format allows a compact disc to hold 1.2 gigabytes of data, and being proprietary, is neither readable nor theoretically writable by standard CD-ROM drives. Developed in parallel with the Dreamcast was Sega's newest arcade platform, the Naomi. Similarly based around a Hitachi SH4 CPU and PowerVR chipset, the Naomi was essentially a beefed-up Dreamcast, and a number of the Naomi's releases, including Crazy Taxi, Power Stone, and Ikaruga, would subsequently be ported to the home. The Dreamcast hit Japanese stores on November 27, 1998, at a price of 29,000 yen, or around $240, and the system's launch lineup was comprised of just four titles. Godzilla Generations, July, and Pen Pen Tri Isilon were all fairly forgettable, but the most popular game by far was Virtua Fighter 3 TB, an updated version of the arcade only Virtua Fighter 3 that went home with nearly every Dreamcast console at launch. Sega sold 150,000 Dreamcast systems at launch and 300,000 more in the weeks that followed. But with the rumored PlayStation 2 looming on the horizon, Sega wanted to build an installed user base as quickly as possible. But a shortage of graphics chips from NEC prevented the manufacture of additional consoles, with Sega president Itty Majiti estimating that 200 to 300,000 additional systems could have been sold in the weeks after launch. With the Dreamcast's North American launch still half a year away, hype for the system was building, with word of new games hitting the Japanese market, including Sonic Adventure and Sega Rally 2 along with an announced $199 price tag. Behind the scenes, Bernie Stoller was mending fences in the post-Saturn era, ensuring that the Dreamcast would be available wherever games were sold, and, much as he had at Sony, also worked to bring back third-party developers. At Sega, we put together the hardware to deliver this experience. But on March 2, 1999, Sony held a press conference to announce the PlayStation 2. With the specious promise of a 128-bit CPU, DVD storage media, backward compatibility, and graphical performance that, Sony claimed, would best even high-end silicon graphics workstations, even before launch, the Dreamcast would already be living under the shadow of the PlayStation's then non-existent successor. Sega of America began advertising the forthcoming Dreamcast in the early summer of 1999, beginning with the It's Thinking advertising campaign a series of print and television ads that may have been a bit too nebulous in that it wasn't always obvious just what it was that Sega was selling. In July, still two months away from launch, gamers could rent the Dreamcast along with Sonic Adventure from one of over a thousand Hollywood video locations nationwide, and at the same time could pre-order the console from one of over 15,000 retail stores. For the North American market, the Dreamcast's modem was upgraded to 56K, and just like the Japanese model, is removable to allow the console to keep up with changes in modem technology. While Sega's dedicated internet service, SegaNet, was still a year away, like the Japanese console, the North American Dreamcast came bundled with a web browser disc, giving the console instant online functionality. None of the Dreamcast's initial games featured online multiplayer play, but a few took rudimentary advantage of the system's teleconnectivity. The following month, due to what Bernie Stoller called a disagreement between himself and Sega chairman Isao Kawa, he was abruptly fired from Sega of America and replaced by underling Peter Moore, who would later oversee the Xbox and Xbox 360 at Microsoft and serve as the head of EA Sports. The Dreamcast was launched at the stroke of midnight on Thursday, September 9, 1999, known affectionately as 9999. Between Thursday and Sunday, Sega sold 372,000 units, 300,000 of which were pre-orders, and after the nearly 1 million Dreamcast consoles that were part of the initial shipment had sold through, 
American retailers had trouble keeping the hardware in stock in the weeks that followed. As was standard for the PlayStation, the Dreamcast came bundled with a demo disc. The first such disc was Dreamcast Generator Volume 1, which features playable demos of six of the system's launch games, plus Sega Bass Fishing, as well as two non-interactive movies. In a continuing effort to put pressure on Sega prior to the release of their own PlayStation 2, ahead of the Dreamcast's launch, Sony dropped the price of the PlayStation to $99 and scheduled the release of Final Fantasy VIII for September 9th. But on that day alone, Sega sold over 225,000 consoles and brought in almost $100 million, which at the time stood as a one-day world record. Just like the chip shortage that hampered the console's release in Japan, the Dreamcast's domestic debut was marred by a rash of defective discs, affecting a large fraction of some game titles. Nevertheless, the North American launch was a huge success, and unlike Japan's meager four-game lineup, on September 9th, 19 games were on store shelves, four of which were among the top 10 best-selling games in the month of September. While zombies and popular media date all the way back to the 1930s, White Zombie. it was with the 1968 horror film Night of the Living Dead that zombies essentially became what they still are today. The dead reanimated as flesh-eating cannibals. In 1996, zombies returned to the forefront of pop culture thanks to the release of two games, Capcom's Resident Evil, Resident which itself inspired the numerous zombie-based survival horror games still being made to this day, <laughs> and Sega's The House of the Dead, a light gun game developed by Sega AM1 using the Virtua Cop engine. With gameplay expectedly similar to Virtua Cop, the House of the Dead is an on-rail shooter in which you have to fight your way through waves of zombies in order to save your girlfriend from the clutches of a mad scientist. The House of the Dead was ported from the Model 2 arcade platform to the Saturn in 1998, but that same year AM1 developed its sequel, The House of the Dead 2 for the Sega Naomi. This was ported to the Japanese Dreamcast in the spring of 1999 before becoming a North American launch title. The House of the dead. Aside from some awful voice acting, ah! I don't want to die. The game is a solid rail shooter even when played with the standard controller. But naturally, shines when played with a light gun. Sega's Dreamcast gun was the official first party gun released in Japan, but due to the then recent Columbine shooting, Sega chose not to release the peripheral in North America. Instead, in this region, the Dream Blaster by Mad Cat served as the official light gun, while Interact's Starfire Light Blaster was also available on launch day. Like the first game, the House of the Dead 2 features branching paths, with the player's direction dictated by split-second reactions. Thanks. You can get outside that way. While the House of the Dead 2 was one of only a small handful of Dreamcast games with light gun support, thanks in part to the system's limited lifespan. At least for fans of the genre, the House of the Dead 2 on its own made the light gun a worthy purchase on launch day. The developer with the largest presence on launch day was arcade mainstay Midway, and while four of their day one releases had arcade roots, the fifth, Ready to Rumble Boxing, was developed specifically for home consoles. Ready to Rumble is an over-the-top arcade-style boxing game in the same vein as Nintendo's Punch-Out! series. The game takes its name from the famous line uttered by Michael Buffer, who served as the ring announcer for seemingly every boxing match you've ever seen, and who reprises that role for this game. The Invincible Boris the Bear Nakama! I have enhanced superior training! With a cartoony cast of characters and an approachably simple control scheme, Ready to Rumble includes a standard arcade mode, which includes basic one and two player play, but also features a meteor single player championship mode, in which you fight in prize matches to earn the money you'll need to both train your fighter and enter title matches. 
The four face buttons on the Dreamcast controller correspond to left and right high and low punches, and the game being 3D allows you to roam around the ring rather than being stuck in one spot. Landing harder punches will fill up your rumble meter, which can both power up your character and let you unleash the rumble flurry. Ready to Rumble Boxing has a slick presentation with graphics that, while colorful, also show off the power of the system. The characters are highly detailed and smoothly animated, and even display visible injuries as the fights go on. The game offers an entertaining single-player experience, but really shines when played with a friend, and its popularity during the Dreamcast's heyday made it one of just 17 titles and one of seven launch games to be included in Sega's All-Stars lineup of budget game releases. Largely forgotten by the sands of time, Expendable was created by British developer Rage Software and is a 3D run-and-gun game not unlike Loaded or Contra Legacy of War. You take the role of a super soldier who has to fight off an invading alien race in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The game employs a top-down oblique perspective, and through the use of the Dreamcast triggers, allows you to strafe as you fire off a variety of weapons. Sadly, what this game would really benefit from is the dual-stick controls used in games like Smash TV, but that, of course, was not possible with the Dreamcast controller. In the old-school tradition, Expendable features 20 discrete levels, most of which culminate in a boss battle. And thankfully as the game is tough, also allows for two-player cooperative gameplay. The game received mostly lukewarm reviews upon release, understandable as it feels more like an early PlayStation title than an early Dreamcast one. That being said, 20 years later, when none of that really matters anymore, Expendable is actually pretty fun. The game has an atmosphere-appropriate soundtrack and great sound effects, and the graphics still look great in 480p. People seem to take the term weekend rental to be derogatory, but it's meant to describe games like Expendable, which while perhaps not worth full price when released, still have what it takes to provide at least a few days worth of fun. The genre with the largest representation on launch day was actually racing, making up seven of the 19 games available. Japanese launch day release Pen Pen Tri Isilon had, for better or worse, reprised its role as a North American launch title. The game features penguin-like creatures called Pen Pen competing in an ice triathlon, or triisalon. The game certainly isn't short on character, once again looks great in 480p, and does support two- and four-player split-screen versus modes. But, awkwardly, it's a kid's game on a console that was not being marketed towards children, and I suspect that Pen Pen Tri Isilon may have been the least popular title on launch day. Half racing game and half extreme sports title, Trick Style is a hoverboard game developed by racing specialist Criterion Games, who would later develop the hit cross-platform series Burnout. After choosing a rider, you'll enter the Velodrome, a skate park that offers areas in which to freestyle, a trainer who has various challenges for you to complete, and a hub from which you can depart to the races that make up the real meat and potatoes of the game. At least early on, the races aren't too challenging and can be won fairly easily after a bit of track familiarization. Trick Style has a total of 18 races run on 14 unique tracks, but each track has to be unlocked one by one by winning the previous race. Trick Style is really the tale of two games. While the racing portion is a lot of fun, the freestyling is not. Unlike games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, your character doesn't start off knowing many tricks and has to learn them by beating the trainer in various challenges which are ultimately required to advance the game. But while Trick Style's controls are adequate for racing, they lack precision.
turning the training challenges into exercises in frustration. The game has impressive visuals, especially for a launch title, and like a few other of the Dreamcast's launch day offerings, is not technically VGA compatible, but can be tricked into running in 480p. The techno soundtrack is reminiscent of games like Wipeout, which seems like it could take place in the same universe as Trickstyle, and was composed by influential hip-hop artist Curtis Mantronic. Trickstyle also includes a VMU game, Trickstyle Jr., which is really just their version of Snake, the first cell phone game that most people played when it was included with the Nokia candy bar phones that were seemingly ubiquitous around the turn of the millennium. Trickstyle is a game that I really want to like. The racing is reminiscent of SSX, which is one of the best titles available at the launch of the PlayStation 2. In fact, so similar is the racing to SSX, in terms of atmosphere, gameplay, even the racers talking smack to one another, that I have to assume that the developers at EA were playing the former while developing the latter. But while SSX chose to do one thing and do it well, the inclusion of the freestyling component, along with controls that simply aren't up to the task, sadly prevent Trickstyle from being one of the standout titles of the Dreamcast's launch. In the 1990s, the Nashville Network, better known as TNN, was a cable television station primarily centered around country music, but that also featured extensive motor racing coverage from a wide variety of racing series. When CRI's Buggy Heat was brought over from the Japanese Dreamcast, a TNN license was added and the presentation altered, with the game now called TNN Motorsports Hardcore Heat. The game is, as the Japanese title would suggest, based on off-road dune buggy racing with a very arcade-like feel. Some reviewers complained about the game's controls, and while there is some validity to this criticism, as it is easy to lose control of your vehicle, the Dreamcast triggers are analog for a reason. Emphasis is placed on driving smoothly rather than treating hardcore heat like a drag race, and once you wrap your head around this, there's plenty of fun to be had. Nice timing. Yes. Hardcore Heat also has some of the best graphics of any of the launch titles and an appropriately hard rock themed soundtrack. All that being said, on launch day, Hardcore Heat might not have been a game that you'd want to drop $50 on, but once again, would have made for a great weekend rental. Finish! Two real-world racing games were available on September 9th, one based on the kart series, better known as IndyCar, and the other on Formula One. Released in Japan as Super Speed Racing, Flag to Flag is a fully licensed IndyCar game developed by Zoom Incorporated and published by Sega. The game features 27 real-world drivers on 18 teams and 19 tracks, although the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is noticeably missing. The game's controls take some getting used to, as in an apparent attempt to mimic real-world physics, your car's steering becomes less responsive as your speed increases. Once I got used to this, however, I found a racing game that was far more enjoyable than most reviews would lead you to believe. As is the case with real-world IndyCar racing, Flag to Flag features a nice balance of both ovals and road circuits, which is a refreshing change from most racing games. As a whole, the audiovisuals are nothing special, but there are little details here and there that stand out. For example, when playing from the driver's perspective, dead bugs will accumulate on your visor and you'll actually wipe them off from time to time. The game is probably not worth tracking down today, but at the launch of the Dreamcast, if you are a motor racing fan looking for something pseudo-realistic to play, Flag to Flag was definitely your best bet. Monaco Grand Prix was developed by Ubisoft and released on the PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and Dreamcast. The game is licensed by the Automobile Club of Monaco rather than the FIA, so all of the team and driver names are fake, but 17 real-world Formula One tracks are included. While the game looks good, how well it controls varies wildly according to which view you select. The guy on the radio yelling at me to hurry up is also irritating. Hurry up! But thankfully he can be shut off, as can the obnoxious music. Hurry up! 
Hurry up! Checkpoint! By the time of this game's release, the PlayStation had already hosted the Cygnosis published Formula One series for several years, and by comparison, Monaco Grand Prix just feels substandard. Which is unfortunate, because the inclusion of a retro game mode that allows you to drive a classic pre-Aero F1 car around a caricature of the Nürburgring would otherwise make this a standout title. Speaking of standout titles, another of Midway's launch day releases was a home conversion of their speedboat racing hit Hydro Thunder. Hydro Thunder! Which at the time of the Dreamcast's release was itself only six months old. No stranger to arcade racing games, Midway's prior releases include the Cruisin' series, as well as the Rush series. Hydro Thunder is the first installment in Midway's Thunder series and was followed by Off-Road Thunder and Arctic Thunder. At the outset of this game, you choose from one of three speedboats and one of three easy tracks. Thunder Park! Once the race begins, you pick up boost fuel along the track, which obviously provides you with a speed boost, but also imparts your boat with the mighty hull, allowing you to plow through fellow racers. Boosting also allows you to perform the boost jump, which both enables you to grab seemingly out of reach power ups, and is needed to access many of the track's shortcuts, which are a key to success in the game. Hey, you found a secret. Hydro Thunder does have a soundtrack, but it's almost inaudible over the chorus of sound effects that, while loud, both make the game more immersive and more arcade-like. The graphics, which look great, are interesting in that the boats and foregrounds are vividly colorful, while the backgrounds have a more realistic look. The level designs are all unique to one another, with each feeling like a themed Disneyland ride. There are a total of 13 tracks, 10 of which need to be unlocked. This alone is no small feat, and in itself provides countless hours of gameplay, but thankfully you can save your progress to the VMU so that there's no need to try to unlock everything in one sitting. You can also play two-player split-screen, which within the practical limitations of home hardware is a welcome feature, but pales in comparison to a pair of arcade cabinets networked together. Hydro Thunder provides an awesome arcade at home experience, but it would have been nice to see the game better fleshed out for the Dreamcast, perhaps including options like championship and time attack modes. Even as is, the game is still legendary among the Dreamcast library, and sat near the top of a launch lineup that already included multiple must-buy games. Japanese street racing was at its peak in the late 80s and 90s, even making its way into pop culture in the form of manga series such as Initial D and Wangan Midnight. Cars like Toyota Supras, Nissan Skylines, and Mazda RX-7s were modified so they could reach speeds upwards of 200 miles per hour, and in the wee hours of the night were raced, illegally of course, on Tokyo's Shuto Expressway. In 1996, Japanese game developer Genki released Tokyo Highway Battle on the PlayStation. The game allows you to modify a number of classic Japanese sports cars and race them on various courses modeled after Tokyo's highway system. In the summer of 1999, Genki released Shutoko Battle on the Japanese Dreamcast, and the game was brought to North America as a launch title under the name Tokyo Extreme Racer. Endorsed by Import Tuner Magazine, Tokyo Extreme Racer continues the formula started by Highway Battle, and while simple arcade modes are available, the Quest mode is really the main event of the game. 
you start off with a modest sum of money with which you buy your first car. The cars are all referred to by their real-world chassis codes, as this was the parlance of the Japanese street racing scene, but they can be renamed when purchased. Driving around a large circuit of Tokyo's expressway, rival drivers are identified on an overlaid map. Pulling up behind them and flashing your high beams triggers the race, but unlike the lengthy multi-lap races of Tokyo Highway Battle, Extreme Racer lacks a delineated finish line. Rather, both you and your rival have what basically amount to life meters, which deplete when either car falls behind. With the money earned from these races, you can further modify your car in order to boost performance as well as purchase additional cars. While the game received average reviews at the time of its release, both Tokyo Extreme Racer and its sequel are fan favorites on the Dreamcast, and it's easy to see why. The game features the car collection and customization aspects of Gran Turismo in a trimmed-down package with a more arcade-like feel. Of the six racing games available on launch day, Tokyo Extreme Racer arguably offered the most complete gameplay experience and would have been well worth picking up for even the most casual of racing fans. The lone launch title published by Activision Blue Stinger is a dark comedy survival horror game developed by the same team that would later produce cult classic Ill Bleed. The game takes place off of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula on the obviously fictitious Dinosaur Island, where a series of events has led to mass deaths and the outbreak of a variety of mutants and monsters. You take control of the main character, Elliot. This is Elliot Balad, Easter Troop C-730, over but are quickly joined by a sidekick named Dogs, and you can switch between them freely throughout the game. Maybe coincidentally or maybe not, the two characters are voiced by the same actors who performed the roles of Sonic and Dr. Robotnik in fellow Dreamcast launch game Sonic Adventure. My name is Elliot G. Balad. Well, who are you? Dogs. I'm a captain of the SS Deanna. As is the case with the genre in general, you roam around a semi-open world fighting monsters and completing tasks in order to advance the storyline. Blue Stinger is considered by some to be so bad that it's good, but I don't see what's so bad about it. The controls aren't perfect and there are issues with the moving camera, but these were common problems with games of that era. The plot is engaging, the voice acting is above average, and if there's one thing that the game isn't guilty of that many others of its ilk are, it's taking itself too seriously. Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday! As you find yourself buying weapons out of vending machines, and engaging in comically bloody battles with mutants in a shopping mall while Christmas music blares over the PA system, It becomes quite obvious that the game has its figurative tongue planted firmly in its cheek. Come back again, and don't forget to bring your stamp card. See ya! Blue Stinger also stands out among the launch lineup as one of only two games that has a plot-driven, sink-your-teeth-into-it style of gameplay, rather than the more arcadey pick-up-and-play character shared by the majority of Day One releases. Blue Stinger is often unfairly compared to games like Resident Evil, when what it is is the video game version of an intentionally campy horror movie. If Weird Al Yankovic's Slime Creatures from Outer Space, an issue of Tales from the Crypt, and a copy of Army of Darkness sounds to you like the recipe for a good time, Blue Stinger is likely right up your alley. Electronic Arts was famously absent on the Dreamcast. This is often blamed on Fallout from the Saturn era, but at one time EA had wanted to create games for Sega's next-gen hardware. It seems that the console war is going to be hotter than ever. In fact, Electronic Arts CEO Larry Probst approached Bernie Stoller about becoming the exclusive publisher of sports games on the Dreamcast. Stoller, however, had just purchased veteran sports developer Visual Concepts for $10 million and wasn't willing to forego producing first-party sports titles. 
The Dreamcast titles NFL 2000 and NBA 2000 gave gamers a preview of the dramatic transformation that video games are about to undergo. The two sides were unable to reach a compromise, and as a result, Electronic Arts would not develop games for the Dreamcast. Visual Concept's most noteworthy sports title up to that point might have been Madden 94, quite possibly the best football game on the Super Nintendo. They also developed NHL 97 for both the Saturn and PlayStation, which while not great, brought the franchise into 3D for the first time. Goal scored by number 91, Sergei Fedorov. For the launch of the Dreamcast, Visual Concepts burst off the line with NFL 2K, a fully licensed simulation football game that was one of the biggest releases in the early days of the console. Obviously, 20 years later, a sports game is not going to seem as noteworthy as one of the many ageless releases on the Dreamcast, but it bears pointing out the impact that NFL 2K made in its own time. When this game was released, the Madden series was on its 10th installment and sat squarely at the top of the video football firmament. But with this one game, Visual Concepts redefined what simulation football should be and by itself gave hardcore sports gamers a reason to buy the Dreamcast. NFL 2K includes all of the modes and features one would expect from a proper sports title, and as such there's really no need to go over each of them here. The game sports a broadcast quality presentation, a level of graphical detail, and smooth animation far beyond anything previously seen on the home console. The player models all look amazing, and every stadium in the league has been painstakingly recreated. Rather than using known broadcasters as most sports games of the day would, the game introduces the fictional Dan Stevens and Peter O'Keefe. I'm Dan Stevens. Peter O'Keefe is at my side, and it's the AFC versus the NFC on the Sega Sports Network. Whose commentary further adds to the game's realism, never seeming to get repetitive or stale. I haven't seen a stick that brutal since you stuck me with the tab at the sports bar in Orlando. <gasps> Wait a I stuck you, as yeah. I recall. <laughs> You uh, scarfed down most of the Buffalo Wings. And who stayed with the franchise through its entire run. That was a nice spiral, Dan. If you're a defender, it could have easily been picked off. NFL 2K has a playbook just as deep as the Madden series, but overlays the formations and plays on the field, making it easier to visualize what will actually happen when they're run. The game also has a far more intelligent AI, so much so that NFL 2K defaults to rookie mode when you first start playing. He's at the 45, but 25, 20. There aren't too many criticisms that could reasonably be leveled at NFL 2K at the time of its release. The game does place an emphasis on passing, as it's nearly impossible to break out for more than a few yards on a running play. There's also the size of the game save file, which at 191 blocks basically necessitates the purchase of a separate VMU. If you were a sports gamer who picked up a Dreamcast on 9999, you went home with one of the very best titles of the Dreamcast's launch. He's at the 15. And the first game in one of the finest franchises in the history of sports video games. After the end of the Dreamcast's life, Sega and Visual Concepts turned NFL 2K into a cross-platform franchise, culminating with ESPN NFL 2K5. These fans have been tailgating for hours, and now they are just moments away from what they've been waiting for. A game that was sold for just $20 in order to compete with Electronic Arts, and is often heralded as the greatest video football game ever made. Eight yards to go. Latte throws this on a rope, and first down. The reception is made past the markers for a first down. Sadly, EA's solution to this was to sign an exclusivity deal with the league, effectively killing off the NFL 2K franchise. The other football game available on launch day was NFL Blitz 2000. Midway practically invented the extreme sports genre popularized by 1993's NBA Jam, and in 1997 they applied the same no-holds-barred style of gameplay to football with the original NFL Blitz. In 1998, Midway released the first sequel, NFL Blitz 99, and this game was ported to home consoles the following year as Blitz 2000.
Once again, the game features seven on seven football with no refs and no rules. Blitz is equal parts football and professional wrestling Sends him to the canvas. with plays ending on body slams and elbow drops. In fact, the original game was too over the top even for the NFL, who pushed Midway to tone down the violence for subsequent releases. All 31 NFL teams are present along with real player names. And in order to flesh out the game for home consoles, the original arcade mode is joined by a playoff mode, as well as the option to play a complete season. The game also has team-specific playbooks, as well as a play editor for those who want to get more creative. At the Versus screen, various codes can be entered into the game using the logos in the lower corner. Some are just cheat codes, while others modify the game by changing the weather and even the size of the player's heads. NFL Blitz 2000 features colorful play-by-play -play commentary provided by voice actor Tim Kitzrow. who as well as doing the rest of the Blitz series, is most famous as the voice of NBA Jam. She's on fire! Boom, the game makes no attempt at visual realism, instead featuring disproportionate players and vividly colorful graphics. They're in the red zone. Regardless of its arcade origins, Blitz 2000 features all the same control options you'd expect from a simulation football game as you can leap, spin, and stiff-arm your way through the defense. Blitz 2000 is certainly no substitute for a proper video football game, but it was also never meant to be. It is, in some ways, the spiritual successor to the Tecmo Bowl series, which fell by the wayside with the rise of the Madden franchise. Blitz 2000 certainly offers a fun single-player experience, but was really meant to be enjoyed as a multiplayer game. Unfortunately, as was the case with all of the Dreamcast's launch titles, it was not possible to play Blitz 2000 online, but the game supports up to four players locally. Were you both a sports fan and someone looking for a party game on launch day, NFL Blitz 2000 would certainly fit the bill. Arrow Wings is a flight simulator game from hardcore heat developer CRI. The game was released as Aero Dancing in Japan, where it was the first of a six-game series on the Dreamcast. Although the game has you flying jet fighters, the obvious comparison to be made here is with Nintendo's Pilot Wings franchise. At the title screen, the game offers an optional basic training mode, which definitely helps orient new players and introduces the basic controls of a flight simulator. First, we have the speedometer. It displays your speed in knots. Once you move on to Arrow Wings proper, three game modes are available. The first, called Blue Impulse Mission, whatever that means, is effectively an advanced training mode, teaching you various techniques like taking off and landing and flying in formation, while a guy who sounds like he's really unhappy with his life choices yells at you over the radio. Pull the control stick and take off! Go! Get landing gear out and prepare for landing! Air brakes! The second mode, Sky Mission Attack, as you flying through floating targets. And the third, free flight, is self-explanatory. Unfortunately, while Arrow Wings has a very polished presentation, the gameplay is unengaging. It lacks the variety found in the Pilot Wings series, and while it does offer a more realistic flight experience, it is too often brutally hard in a way that makes you not want to try again. Out of formation! Out of formation! Arrow Wings would likely have been a major disappointment for anyone who, on launch day, took it home expecting an Ace Combat-style experience based on the game's cover art. If, however, you were looking for an Ace Combat-style experience on launch day, then the Dreamcast had you covered with Konami's Air Force Delta. The gameplay itself is really quite boilerplate for anyone familiar with the Ace Combat series. Each mission is preceded by a briefing, after which you pick your aircraft and take to the skies. The game defaults to a simple control scheme that combines pitch, roll, and yaw, but thankfully this can be changed in the options menu. Your plane is of course loaded down with an unrealistic amount of ordnance, 
so that running out of ammo is really no concern. Mission objectives include things like shooting down a sortie of enemy bombers or destroying a naval convoy. Once you clear these objectives, the mission ends, and you have the option of watching a replay, which is actually pretty neat. After that, you're awarded cash compensation based on the number of enemies you've shot down, which you can then use to buy new aircraft. The game is not VGA compatible, but the graphics still look good in 480i. And for a game that has you visiting fiery death upon the enemy at 10,000 feet, Air Force Delta has an oddly upbeat, jazzy soundtrack. Though the game would have made for a fun weekend rental, with a total of 20 missions that naturally increase in difficulty, there's enough content here to justify the game as a launch day purchase for fans of the genre. Three fighting games were on store shelves on launch day and might have provided the biggest reason to also go home with the official Dreamcast arcade stick sometimes referred to as the Age Tech Stick in North America. With an MSRP of about $60, it features Japanese-style controls and has both a color scheme and layout consistent with Sega's Japanese arcade cabinets. Although a handful of other sticks were produced for the Dreamcast over its short lifespan, it's this that remains the most sought after for Sega's final arcade at home console. Capcom created some of the greatest 2D fighting games ever released, but in the late 90s, the 3D fighting realm was being dominated primarily by franchises like Tekken and Sega's own Virtua Fighter. But in 1999, Capcom unveiled a unique take on the genre with Power Stone. Released on Sega's Naomi Arcade hardware and ported to the Dreamcast in time for its North American launch. Welcome to Power Stone Wars. Power Stone is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game that takes place in a 3D arena around which both players can freely roam. The space is fully interactive, allowing you to jump onto platforms, swing around poles, and even hang from the ceiling. You can also throw various objects at your opponent, and pick up a variety of constantly respawning limited-use weapons. The game takes its name from the Power Stones that appear during each match. Each player begins the fight holding one such stone, but collect and hang on to two more, and the character temporarily changes into a more powerful form, complete with a set of special moves. Eight characters are available to choose from, and as is standard for fighting games, each has a distinct set of moves as well as their own arena. The vibrant graphics look great in 480p, and the soundtrack has a cinematic quality. Power Stone's cartoony presentation belies its depth and complexity. The game is easily on par with Capcom's extensive catalog of fighters in terms of fun, challenge, and replayability. And both Power Stone and its sequel rightfully take their place among the most beloved games on the Dreamcast. Although Power Stone was Capcom's only release for the Dreamcast's launch, the company would arguably go on to be Sega's biggest third-party supporter, with such marquee hits as Resident Evil Code Veronica, Mars Matrix, and Marvel vs. Capcom 2, which is considered by some to be the best game on the system. At the time of its release, Power Stone was one of the most unique fighting games ever seen was one of the must-buy titles on launch day, and was the first in a long line of innovative games that highlight the Dreamcast's library.
Mortal Kombat Gold is a home adaptation of and upgrade to 1997's Mortal Kombat 4, which itself was the franchise's final arcade release. Along with the standard arcade modes, also included are a team battle option, along with several endurance modes and a welcome practice mode. The game brings back a handful of characters that were included in earlier installments in the series but were omitted from Mortal Kombat 4, and whereas the arcade release introduced character-specific weapons to the gameplay, Mortal Kombat Gold allows you to choose the weapon your character uses. Aside from this new weapon system, Mortal Kombat Gold still follows the same basic gameplay as the rest of the series. One-on-one -on -one fighting punctuated by extreme violence, including the series' signature fatalities. Fatality. When Mortal Kombat 2 was released in 1993, it was hailed as one of the best releases of what was, in retrospect, arguably the golden age of arcade fighters. But six years and a few Mortal Kombats later, a few minor gameplay tweaks notwithstanding, the series felt like it was on autopilot. Fatality. It might therefore come as no surprise that Mortal Kombat Gold was not well received by the gaming press. Criticisms included the aforementioned stale gameplay, as well as the game's graphics which were lackluster considering the Dreamcast's capabilities. This does make sense, however, as visually the game is a fairly faithful arcade port, while the Dreamcast is more powerful than Midway's Zeus hardware. No doubt Mortal Kombat Gold was taken home by many a hardcore fan of the franchise, but the third and final fighting game available on September 9th, which is widely regarded as one of the best games ever published on the Dreamcast, was the lone launch day release from one of the most storied arcade developers of all time. Namco. Soul Calibur was a Namco System 12 release and is the sequel to 1995's Soul Edge. The company entered the 3D fighting realm with the critically acclaimed Tekken in 1994, and Soul Edge was a successful attempt at adding weapons to the same formula. The game was subsequently ported to the PlayStation and was released in the West as Soul Blade in early 1997. Soul Calibur debuted in the arcades in 1998, and Namco ported it to the Dreamcast, where it was released in Japan in early August of 1999 before becoming a North American launch title. Plot-wise, the game picks up where Soul Edge left off, if that matters bringing back most of the characters while adding several new ones. Welcome back to the stage of history. When you begin the game, you can choose from 10 characters, but can unlock eight more by beating the game's arcade mode with the existing ones. Perhaps the biggest improvement to Soul Calibur over Soul Edge in terms of gameplay is the eight-way run, which allows you to move freely about the ring, evading enemy attacks, and even attacking from the side and rear. The arcade mode is joined by team battle, time attack, and survival modes, and just like Mortal Kombat Gold, also offers the opportunity to practice. Although I wouldn't call Soul Calibur easy, was seriously wounded, but the soul still burns. It is one of the more accessible fighting games out there. While each character has an expansive moveset, you can do well just using the basic moves and then start to layer the various combos into your working arsenal as you gain experience. To that end, the mission battle mode includes a short game tutorial to help familiarize the player with the game's controls, particularly those that were added to or improved upon from Soul Edge. Perfect. Mission Battle Mode also features a variety of battles that allow you to uncover parts of the storyline and completion of both the training missions and the subsequent battles earns you points, which you can then use to buy art cards that unlock additional features in the game. Soul Calibur's graphics are one of the game's biggest talking points, 
and are not only gorgeous, but are actually better than the arcade original. The home version has an expanded color palette, improved lighting effects, and uses higher resolution textures to achieve a level of detail that, running at a smooth 60 frames per second, makes Soul Calibur one of the best looking games to ever appear on the Dreamcast. The sound has also been improved upon, with the game's music, sound effects, and speech being of much higher quality and clarity than the arcade original. This victory strengthened the soul of Mitsubishi. You win! Soul Calibur's announcer is voiced by Jeff Manning. Battle one, fight! an accomplished video game voice actor who also played the announcer in the original Super Smash Bros. I'm not sure that it's even possible to use too many superlatives when talking about Soul Calibur. Over the course of the console's lifetime, few titles better showed off the Dreamcast's audiovisual capabilities, and on top of that, in terms of gameplay, it also represents a high watermark for 3D fighters. Not content to simply release an arcade-perfect port, as they easily could have, Namco rebuilt Soul Calibur from the ground up, adding numerous features and improvements, and taking advantage of the Dreamcast's hardware superiority over their System 12 platform. In doing so, Namco created what was arguably the best game available at the console's launch, This victory strengthens the soul of Tan Tong Yo and certainly one of the greatest titles in the Dreamcast's library. Soul Calibur was also one of the best-selling games on the console, with over a million copies shipped worldwide. But the 19th and final game available at launch was also by far and away the most successful title ever released on the Dreamcast. The legend will never die. Sonic the Hedgehog was one of the most popular franchises of the 16-bit era, but it was oddly underrepresented on the Sega Saturn. But Sonic was coming back for the Dreamcast in one of the most hotly anticipated games of the system's launch. The Sonic franchise had made forays into the 3D world as early as 1992 in the form of the Chaos Emerald collecting bonus rounds in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. But its first dedicated 3D game was 1996's Sonic 3D Blast, which appeared on both the Mega Drive and Genesis, but also the Saturn, where it was one of the console's better-selling titles. Also appearing on the Saturn was the 16-bit compilation disc Sonic Jam, as well as Sonic R, a racing game that was the only of the three titles purpose-developed for the console. Although Sonic the Hedgehog was Sega's flagship franchise on the Genesis, notably absent from the Saturn was a mainline entry in the series. The American-based Sega Technical Institute had been working on just such a game, Sonic Extreme, even showing a playable demo at 1996's E3. But the project was cancelled not long after. The following year, Yuji Naka's Sonic team finally began working on a game for the Saturn, placing a greater emphasis on storytelling and set in a fully 3D world, but this project too was shelved, with what was completed being added to the Sonic Jam disc in the form of a bonus level called Sonic World. Naka was subsequently made aware of the forthcoming Dreamcast, and Sonic Team began reworking the aborted Saturn project for the new system. Sonic Adventure was unveiled at a press event in Tokyo on August 22, 1998, three months before the Dreamcast's Japanese release. The game was, however, not a Japanese launch title, appearing on store shelves just in time for Christmas. The game was, however, rushed out the door to meet the holiday deadline, and, effectively unfinished, was hampered by camera and control issues. Thankfully, the game was in a finished state by the following July, in time for the system's North American pre-launch rollout to Hollywood video locations. As was the case with the aborted Saturn project, 
Sonic Adventure is far more story-driven than previous entries in the series. The game has six playable characters, including Tails, Knuckles, Amy Rose, Big the Cat, and the E-102 Gamma robot. Only Sonic is selectable at the outset, however, while the other five characters become unlocked at various points in the game. Sonic Adventure is split up into both adventure fields and action stages. The adventure fields generally involve performing actions, such as placing this statue into its keyhole, in order to gain access to the action stages, whose gameplay is much more akin to the Sonic titles of yore. Some of these action stages incorporate games within the game, including snowboarding, and even a Nights into Dreams-themed pinball table. The transition to 3D can be a bit jarring for veterans of the 16-bit era, but once acclimated, you'll find a game that maintains the spirit of the franchise while ushering it into the modern era. But gamers expecting the 3D world to bring with it an element of exploration may be disappointed, as Sonic Adventure's gameplay is still quite linear. Common to earlier third-person perspective efforts, Sonic Adventure does suffer from some camera issues, and exacerbated by Sonic's trademark speed, the game doesn't control as well as some of its peers. But these are fairly minor issues that can be worked around. The graphics, on the other hand, look incredible, and while the game generally tries to maintain the pseudo-cartoony visual style of the series, some areas still end up looking drop-dead gorgeous. The voice acting can be hit or miss. Now what do you want? I want all of the chaos emeralds. Better not interfere, or else. Or else what, you big loser? And some of the game's sound effects seem less punchy, but the soundtrack is top notch. And while Sonic and Sonic 2 composer Masato Nakamura had long since moved on from video games, Sonic Adventure brought back several sound designers from the earlier titles. What? Tails? No! Look out below! In addition to the main story, which takes nearly 10 hours to complete, Sonic Adventure also offered downloadable content, including special events like the Samba GP, a kart race commemorating the release of Samba de Amigo, which can still be downloaded and played today using a Dream Pi to connect your Dreamcast to the internet. Along with NFL 2K and Soul Calibur, Sonic Adventure offered the best bang for your buck in terms of longevity and replayability, and was a no-brainer purchase for all but the most vehement of platformer haters on launch day. The game sold 2.5 million copies worldwide and spawned one sequel, 2001 Sonic Adventure 2, the last title in the franchise to appear on Sega hardware. Though it came to market over a year before any other console of its generation, was competitively priced, and ultimately was home to a myriad of titles still considered must-play games to this day, Sega's Dreamcast was ultimately unable to successfully compete against the juggernaut PlayStation 2, though the console's demise is more a reflection of the time than a reflection on the system itself. Sega ceased production of Dreamcast hardware in the spring of 2001, and the last official North American game, NHL 2K2, was released in February of 2002. Sega would subsequently shift to cross-platform third-party development, releasing numerous titles on what could be argued was the spiritual successor to the Dreamcast, Microsoft's Xbox. But that's all a story for another day. That's going to do it for this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Yeah!